Good evening, everyone. I'm Anna Stewart, manager at the GFR Art Gallery in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our virtual Q&A. I hope everyone has their glass of wine, coffee or tea ready to enjoy the evening with us. The artist, Pippa Hetherington, will be in discussion with our guest speaker, Mabali, Sikakana, who will be speaking to Pippa about how themes of family, cultural memory and displacement are articulated through the Cuttings 1820 to 2020 exhibition. Hi Pippa. Hi Anna. Hi Mabali, welcome. Hi, hi Anna. Pippa obtained a Masters in Fine Art through the International Center of Photography Bard College, New York, USA. Her work invites questions around family, history, cultural identity, and memory. Working with photography, video documentary, and textiles, she explores untold stories of loss and remembrance. She has been represented in solo and group exhibitions in Cape Town, Johannesburg, Bloemfontein, Durban, London, Dublin, New York City, and Washington, DC. Thank you for joining us, Pippa. Thanks very much for having, having both of us, um, Anna. Uh, I would just like to introduce Mabali to everyone as well. Mabali has an MA in Publishing Studies from Bits University and is a commissioning editor who produces South Africa nonfiction books. Her primary interests are in women's historical and contemporary contributions to South Africa's narrativizing of itself, especially black women, and is enlivened by texts that probed, probe and problematize accepted narratives about South African society. She has written for the Johannesburg Review of Books, as well as the Mail and Guardian. Welcome, Abali. Thank you so much, Anna, for having me tonight. Thank you for being here. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> after, after Pippa and Mabali's discussion, um, I will ask questions to Pippa. So please, everyone watching, if you would like Pippa to answer a question or Mabali, please type the questions in the chat and uh, we will um, have time to then answer the questions. Well, Pippa and Mabali, you can you know, take the floor. Yeah, very good. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Anna. I just want to quickly jump in um, just to thank Mbali so much for um, being part of this conversation. We had a really lovely chat over the weekend and it just felt very comfortable and interesting and it felt like we could have spoken for hours and hours and hours. So luckily tonight we've got a cut off time. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so excited about tonight and um, I just hope everyone else is as uh, absolutely uh, just enthralled by what has happened with the project as we all are. Um, I just want to hop right into the first question that I have um, and it's coming from our conversation, but also because I think it's such a good um, off ramp. Um, this whole project for you has been around history and identity, and not only of a region in the Eastern Cape, but also of your own uh, lineage and history. Um, these ideas of identity and history for you go deep, um, and there are very real and specific reasons as to why a project like this is important to you. If you could just speak to that story for us. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, uh, having been away from South Africa for a few years um, really forced me to, well, it didn't force me, it was a chosen kind of um, thing to look back from where I come from and, um, and also art 
articulate who I who I am and where I come from to people who didn't know me or or had either no reference of um, South Africa or a very um, sort of single narrative about South Africa, and um, and I think while I was away looking looking from, through a different lens back into this country. Um, I started really inquiring what my heritage meant to me. And I was very lucky growing up because my father was very um, informed. He informed us a lot about where we come from in terms of um, through, through the 1820 settler history, which was, which was wonderful. And he was a great storyteller himself, but he, he really researched the history very intimately through the reminiscences of my great, great grandfather who wrote his reminiscences towards the end of his life. And, um, and I think I had that as a, you know, I was coming off a base where I was informed to an extent. Um, but while I was away, the thing that made, the thing that really um, drew, drew me into the history in a different way was wondering where the women's voices were in the, in the history telling and the storytelling of the history and then also um, at the same time almost in the parallel process I um, doing an MFA was forced to or asked to really um, interrogate why I was making the work that I was making and I started turning very much towards textile and fabric but also stitching and with that came this realization that when I, when I looked deeply, it was definitely um, a situation where I'd been influenced deeply by the Kaiskammer Art Project artists. And, and then the, the more, I, the deeper I went into that, the more I realized how our histories that, that, the, that I'd been working alongside these women for 20 years, um, mainly as a documentarian, not as a fellow artist. And, and I realized that the women that are very women that I've been working with and developed wonderful relationships with were also descendants from a history that I come from, um, from the same region in the same time. Yet the histories were told very separately. And I think it was easier for me to see that from a distance than it was for me to see it here, living here. So that's, that's kind of where it started. And, um, and, and, and then, of course, along with it comes identity and unpacking um, what that means and knowing where you come from and looking to where you're heading. Absolutely. I mean, and as we looking at the project, it's 1820 to 2020. That's a 200 year history and such a specific one uh, be between yourself and the, your fellow artists. And I wonder now, uh, going into the process of how it all happened, um, a collaboration of this kind with different perspectives um, underlying it is quite complex. Um, not to mention the history, um, that history and identity are, are fraught topics, you know, and they have a lot of scholarship and debate attached to them. Um, if you could take us through the different stages of the process um, of getting the project made together. So, so as I, as I mentioned, the idea the idea definitely started in in New York with my own personal history, where I had made a a wall hanging with a whole lot of photographs. I'd stitched um, fabric photographs together, and I'd, and I'd of um, from my family archives of um, a combination of um, photographs of great grandparents and grandparents and the matriarchs in my family, as well as inherited things like tea towels and um, um, my, my mother's old labeling from school and old recipes, as well as a, a, a fabric photograph of the title deed of the land that my, my, great, my, my ancestors were seeded when they came to South Africa. And I, and I had it on the wall initially as a, as, a, as a wall hanging. And as I looked at it and I stepped away, it felt there was something that didn't feel quite comfortable at looking at this history almost in reverence because it's not that I disown any of my history. I, it, 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 it's, I don't necessarily feel like some parts of it need, should be revered. So 
intuitively I took the piece off the wall and I actually made a dress out of it and suddenly it felt a whole lot more um it it, it felt like it was not the right thing to do but it felt like the again intuitive thing to do which was to wear my history and mm -hmm. um and and then when I came back to South Africa having thought about the, the the you know the female descendants of the frontier wars of the eight, of the eighteen of the eighteen hundreds in in the Eastern Cape, and and the role that the Khoza played and the the, the, the eighteen twenty settlers played and the colonial government of the day played. Um, uh, my first port of call was to go up to the Eastern Cape and talk to the artists from Hamburg. And in in an initial workshop, we discuss this concept of wearing our histories and what that means. But we also discuss the concept of how the, how the histories have been told separately and how uh, it's, it's really fascinating how you, even when you go into a museum like the King Williamstown Museum, which is the most fantastic museum, historically the way that the, that the um, exhibitions are shown is that there's, you walk into the one section and then there's you know, all the missionary, English, German, settler history, outfits and um, information. And then across in a different building, there's the closer history. So even the displays are separated. Um, so we discussed how we could bring it into, into a shared history rather than a single story. And, um, and we, we thought that by making outfits, was a wonderful way of doing it and, and bringing fabric together and putting the fabric in conversation as a metaphor for our own conversation. And then the next step after that was to, we, we, we decided that we, we really needed to spend a lot of time together and kind of intense time together. So we facilitated and um, we crowdfunded for a residency down here in Cape Town for five days where four of the senior artists from the Kaskama Art Project came down and we literally ate, slept, breathed, sang, cried, and made, made work together for a week. And in that process, every morning before we, be, we began, we would sit down and have a discussion about, we would have certain talking points. And um, Stefani Victor, who from the King Williamstown Museum, who's a wonderful historian, supplied us with some really interesting imagery, which was pretty, hard going and for, for instance there was a and it's actually in despair in the King Williamstown Museum there's an there's an old notice from the mid 1800s of um, it was a government notice saying um, anybody not wearing European clothing will be arrested um, so and I believe that outside many of those towns those, those colonial towns they had booths where people wearing traditional outfits would arrive and they'd take their traditional outfits off and they'd have to put European clothing on. So, so it goes back into those kind of layers as well as, um, as well as the colonial story, but it's, 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 it's much more nuanced and much more specific to that area. And um, so that residency was really, really important because I think that was the crux and, and, and one of the pivotal moments of us generating work. And at the end of that, we had made, we'd made 10 outfits and um, and then the next step was for me to take the outfits up to the Eastern Cape and then take portraits of women wearing the outfits. And in that visit, another pivotal um, um, moment happened where um, when my ancestors arrived on the, in, in South Africa, they were given land right next to something called the clay pits, which isn't actually clay. It's a whole, it's a mound of these oxide rocks that when you rub them together, they make a beautiful oxide pigment, which then can be made into clay using, I, I think, you know, um, uh, nowadays you can use Vaseline and water, but, but traditionally animal fat was used and it was used to adorn people's bodies. It was, it was cosmetic, but it was also used to dye um, um, cow hides and then blankets. And in the 1820s, the uh, British government of the time put a ban on the closer accessing the clay pits, which of course was a, was a conflictual situation because they'd, they'd already constructed a boundary of the Fish River between, you know, the Corsa being on the one side and the, the, the British protector being on the other side. So the settlers were essentially brought in as a buffer, as a human buffer between the two. 
And um, so my ancestors were given land right next to these clay pits, which were very dangerous because it, it, was, it, it, it sparked one of the biggest frontier wars. And then additionally, the Br British government of the time m made it illegal for, any, for the Corsa to trade with the British and actually interestingly enough, the British to trade with the, with the Boers. So there was, nobody could trade with anybody. So my great, great, great grandfather, who was the father of the family who came out, ended up trading illegally and was involved in a botched trade deal and got, and was killed by the Corsa. And then his wife who had just had her seventh child died of a broken heart a few months later, leaving seven orphans. And then the seven orphans were eventually sent off to different families and my great great grandfather was too old to be adopted so he went and he became an intern for a blacksmith and then his life began. So the clay pits were a really important part of my own personal history. So Nozeti Magobalo who, who is one of the artists from Kaiskama Art Project and I went to the clay pits together. We did a field trip and it was the first time I had been there and it was the first time she had been there. And our responses were very different. And in, in, in for me, it was, it was fascinating historical evidence of stories that I'd been, I'd, I'd, I'd read in my, in my you know, ancestors' writings. For Nozeti, it was more of an oral tradition, tra traditionally told story, but also it was an incredibly physical um, experience for her. And, but it was a very powerful experience and we collected some of those rocks and we took them back to the studios in Hamburg and we ground, the, we ground them and made the, the ochre pigment and then used the ochre pigment to, to then dye cotton, cotton fabric, which we, we, we had printed um, negatives of landscapes of, of the region. And we used the negative as a kind of a, a nod to um, um, you know, the photographic negative being a repository for memory. So, so it was a very, and, 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 and you know, the, 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 key, the, when you make that ochre pigment, it's, it's incredibly rich. The color is rich, 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 rich. And it, when it dries, it actually looks like dried blood. So it had these unexpected outcomes for us. Mm -hmm. And none of the work was preconceived in terms of what the one step led us to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. And then once we had done that, then we started playing around with layering and embellishing the, the, the fabrics with stitching. And um, yeah, so that's, that's how, how it developed. It sounds incredibly organic, but at the same time, it has a sort of cathartic element to it, um, or even something veering towards the spiritual. In, in this. And I wondered, as you were speaking, um, there's a lot about the history that you know from your ancestors and from historians and the like, but I do wonder what are some of the surprising things you discovered about yourself um, in this process? Um, and it's even about your fellow artists or about the region itself. What popped out for you through this project from doing this project specifically um, that you didn't know before? I think um, I think pro I think process um, I think working with different ma materials was is one thing. So so you know the experience of working with the clay um, was was a very rewarding um, technique. And then and then just just in terms of that that kind of thing, um, I I hadn't thought through how I was going to display the the dresses. So, so I suddenly ha had to think, well, you know, do I use body forms or do I use mannequins and paint the mannequins, but then what color do I paint the mannequins? And then do I, so, so I went on a, a um, there's an artist down here in Cape Town called Kathy Stanley who helped me sort of come up with f a few prototypes and some of them were cloth, but then the cloth was white. So then we were like, well, we just looked like this white cotton. So then we tried to, you know, we pigmented that with the clay, but then it was, there was too much. And then we, we worked with plaster and we worked with all these different materials. And eventually we came up with wire and wire was so interesting because when we made the wire form and it stood on its own, it, it looks, looks great. But as soon as you put clothing on it, 
the it's the clothing becomes transparent and quite ethereal and as you say it like it has it has a ghost you know it 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 spoke to the spiritual side of things and also it's it's kind of nameless as in it's 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 the garment that 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 we're looking at it's not the body although it has a body form and i think that for me was a it took me into a much a much more um, esoteric space than I was expecting. You know, mm. I thought it would be quite an anthropological, um, interesting kind of art making process. But I think the the connection to the connection, the deep connection to land, was something that that I kind of had a, a theory. You know, I, I connected it to theoretically, but I think being there, it. it physically was a very very different experience from what i had anticipated um i don't know what else there are i think there were loads of other things but i just can't think of them right now yeah that's actually quite a, a very uh, beautiful um uh, story that you were able to think of i also wonder um you know here we talk about women uh, coming into history in this way and a lot about the land conversation is very masculine. It's very big men debates. Um, and the conversation is this big. You know, it's about, you know, the whole of South Africa. It's about our history from, you know, the very earliest ancestors to today. You know, everything seems way bigger than any of us can chew on. And this for me is uh, a much more specific conversation. It's a much smaller bite-sized conversation. And I wonder as a conversation, what are the questions that you think that this project specifically evokes? Um, if we look at these garments, um, you know, what questions is this project um, asking of itself, of us? Um, so I think, I think it's, um, you know, I think different people will have, have different um, responses to to the artwork, depending on where, you know, what their own histories are. Um, so I don't think there'd be one kind of sweeping kind of response that everybody feels, but I certainly think that um, the going back to the making of the garments, it was interesting. Somebody asked me a question the other day and said, is there a specific reason that they're all dresses? And, and I said, there is, there wasn't, any specific reason they, we didn't sit down and sketch 10, 10 dresses we made each one collectively and they all ended up as dresses and then when spending time with the artists what came what came out which was very interesting was how making the work for for um for them was kind of had had a um there was a there was a pride in it, but there was also something painful in remembering how um, dress had been um, affected and what was required and what was expected, and how traditional dress had been lost. So there was a sense of loss, but a sense of 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 pride as well, because it, there's a duality of um, having lost this um, connection to traditional outfits and traditional wear. But at the same time, an incredible sense of feeling very beautiful in what what we had made and what we were, what what a lot of the women were wearing, and um, and and the honesty that that it was spoken, you know, the, the um, again Nazetti brought it up and she said, you know, it makes me makes me proud and happy and makes me feel beautiful, but it also reminds me of the loss, you know, so so I think. I think there are very many different re reactions and responses to the work that it evokes. And I guess my hope is that what it does is it really gets people to, to seriously look at their history and, um, and not necessarily brutally or, but, 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 but critically and, um, and, and also try and understand why we, who we are today because of where we come from. Right, and I think for me, it's about the threads of history. And this is almost like taking a few threads coming from you and your family and the families of the different artists, those threads coming together as well in this project. 
as part of a sort of um, textile that you've all created by coming together as this collective. Um, and, and that uh, metaphor for me uh, has actually become um, quite interesting in viewing the work. And um, for me, when I looked at it, I thought, how interesting that the dresses themselves, um, I almost struggled to see the, the Kosam Bago type of um, dress in it, even though I can sometimes see elements of it, but what pops out more than anything is the more European dress. And, and you know that concept of that erasure it's there and the elements are there but the garment most of the garments come together to be more of a of a of a, of a european dress i thought even that uh was a, a quite an interesting nod to the history itself um yeah so yeah, exactly. yeah. And, I just, and i think i think just to jump in there quickly the choice of fabric um was very interesting because we we were really lucky we were donated quite a lot of fabric by a lot of people and but then but then we also was purposefully went and bought fabric that we felt that we needed to bring in and and that was really the shui shui and the the dutch wax print mm. that we were really mm. interested in bringing in and that for us was a, a way of also talking about how it, it it's this very um it's, it's kind of uncomfortable how it does loop back to colonialism no matter how much we would like it not to but it does and it's it's important to acknowledge that and just to, and to go you know that it's like the you know the shui shui was originally Indonesian German then beca has become synonymous with Corsa culture you know in South Africa similarly with the Dutch wax cloth being manufactured in Holland and becoming synonymous with West Western African identity yet it, it there's this yet the history tells us a diff different story or not a different story but it tells us a story of how it got there. And and then it becomes absorbed into into identity. So it's it's complex and it's complicated. Um, but it's also just you know, I I, th I thought it was quite interesting how we ended up making outfits that were, um, you know, yeah, that weren't that traditional. Mm. And I. Th pleased in a way because it's it although it's not a fashion it's not a it's not a collection of fashion items it's it's also you know um i was talking to um a woman who's done a lot of research in in fa in you know in in the fashion um anthropology and and how in africa f fashion hasn't been documented as as a development it's it's if you go to a, like a big you know, there's a big museum in cape town here that in the archives the the kind of african fashion is traditional and it's historical and it it kind of stops at a certain point and then and then the the development of fashion is is um documented as in what the where all the european influences whereas you know uh, on this continent there are certain you know there, there's fashion development there's clothing development there's style development so so it, it was interesting how that those styles and the and the and the applique and the frills and the aprons was very much about what was resonant with the women i was working with Hmm, those are some very illuminating answers and I just feel like I'm getting deeper and deeper into this work the more that you speak. <laughs> I think Anna wanted to break into questions and I think we're, we're doing good time for that. Okay, great. great. Yes, um, thank you for some of that. Yeah, that, you know, that really, um, I think you, like Anna, you're on mute. No. Better. Okay. I'm. Um, I'm not. I'm. Um, you're very on. faint. Oh, there you. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um. There's there's quite a few interesting questions that came up while you were speaking, so let me start with the first one. Um. Did the color of the oxides of the clay pits 
create the red blankets that the Tosa nation is famous for? I, I believe it did, yes. Yeah, and that's, that's where the, the term red blanket people comes from. Um, next question. How is the land of the clay pits used today? Is there any discussions and knowledge about ownership issues? That's, that's a really, really good question. Um, Mbali and I actually discussed it over the weekend. So just going back a bit to the, 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 what happened with the clay pits, were, um, it, so then it became illegal for closer people to access it. And then in the mid 1800s, the um, so it, and and it, it 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 was part of a fa of a settler 1820 settler farm, and then those that um, I think they were the Brown family, and the Brown family then sold it privately to some, to a new owner in the, in the mid 1800s. I think I've got my dates right. Um, and the next farmer actually turned it into a paint factory, which which is extraordinary because then that person identified the the pigment as a commodity and if you go there today you can actually see ruins of where the paint factory had been built and um leaving the 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 mound intact the the, the he had like a little trolley system that took the rocks down to this other place that ground them and then mixed them and then he sold and so it was a it was a commercial venture and then in the, in the early 1900s, the farm was then sold again to a new owner, a white owner, and then white um, farmer. And then I think um, uh, somewhere in the 1900s was sold again to, to the family who still own the farm. So they own the farm. Um, and they are incredibly... So access in terms of not allowing people there is not it's private although it's private land the farmers themselves are incredibly um mindful and um they uh, about the history and they know a lot about the history and they welcome people to come and have a look at it look at it as a historical site not necessarily as a as a commercial commodity okay um Question, at any time have you felt guilty about your 1820 heritage? And if so, has this been a healing process? So, no, I, I mean, I haven't felt guilty, but I have felt, um, I have felt concerned, I guess, um, in, the lead up to the two, in the lead up to the commemoration, the 200 year commemoration. Um, so just to answer the second part of the question, yes, it, it has been an incredibly healing process, um, but, but that's not why I did it, but also it's the, he the healing was something else that was happening. It wasn't because of my, because I'm an 1820 settler descendant, but at the same time, I was very, very um, concerned and aware of the build up to the, the commemoration in, in around the 2020 um, um, you know, so all the celebrations that were in store, and and there was there was definitely a narrative that was that was starting to happen that was very, um, I, th I thought, quite uh, painful and tactless, and wasn't taking into consideration the entire history, and was being incredibly exclusive of the of the closer side of the story. So so I found that quite disturbing um you know and 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 actually it was it was one of the driving it it, it was one of the drivers to to make this work it seems that this is a process of stitching two versions of a history together i'm interested to hear why you call the exhibition cuttings so the the word i mean cuttings the, you know, first of all, stitching and, and embroidery and um, sewing can be a form of reparation as it can be um, a form of segregation. It can be violent, you know, the act of the stitch, the act of the, the needle um, can actually be quite, quite a violent thing of piercing something or it can be, um, you know, also when you're sewing, you, you're constantly 
pricking yourself and drawing blood and um and cuttings i think there's something about you know when you cut something it it, it, it never it's never the same again but then when you take so it, it's a bit of a metaphor of the dress that i made out of the the wall hanging i took the wall hanging off and to cut that the the, the act of cutting was incredibly um, nerve-wracking but it was so empowering and, and, and cathartic at the same time because I knew that that thing would never ever be the same and then by stitching it back together again I was making it into something different so it wasn't ignoring it wasn't throwing it away it wasn't erasing it it was it was acknowledging that it, it had been something before and then by bringing it back together so I think cuttings for us you know, we did a lot of cutting, <laughs> so that as well, we cut, and, and the motion of cutting is, it's quite a thing, because you can make mistakes, and, but then, but then, it, it's, it's also just, it's, it's a great metaphor for, for dividing things, for separating things, and then, of course, there's the, the, the famous Kai cuttings in the Eastern Cape that everybody knows, or a lot of people know, and how that road cuts through the land, so there are a lot of there are a lot of reasons that we we um, we use that word. Okay. Next question: uh, What was the response of the subjects, the female descendants, in the photographic prints when they wore the dresses and garments made by the artists? So that was actually it was an incredible shoot because um, I. I spoke to many of many of the people I had I kind of had ideas of who I who I want to you know sort of match which dress with who but I, I did let people decide as well so sometimes um, somebody would put on an outfit and then they would take something from another outfit and put that on so and um, behind you Anna is is Nozetti in her pink dress and she's wearing an apron and when her daughter, when we did Nozetti's, um, we did Sino, her daughter's um, portrait, Sino wanted to take the apron from Nozetti, what Nozetti was wearing, and she turned it into a, a top. And, and then she wore a different skirt. So, so people, and there was no mirror either. So, so people chose what they wanted to wear. And then I think because there was no mirror, it didn't have like a fashion-y feeling to it, 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 but it, but because of the backdrop and because of the formality of the styling of like a photographic portrait, there was a sense of um, performance. Okay. Um, well, I have a comment, not a question. Um, viewing the exhibition made me rethink my heritage, which is also linked to the settlers and to the Kosa nation. And thank you very much. <laughs> um, Okay, well, there's another question that popped up now. Um, do you have plans for the exhibition and conversation to continue to get a further mm -hmm. reach and get involved in making a difference to the greater conversations around land and history? It's such a meaningful way to bring the awareness of the two histories and the importance of looking at both sides for understanding and healing. So um, that's actually a really great question because if you if you look at the way that the garments are made, we purposefully didn't finish them off perfectly. There's some you know the edges are frayed. There's there's um, there's old um, doily cloth you know and, and lace that's that's blood stained. The um, you can sometimes see a pin that's been left in, and there's like a little bit of a, a hole or. Um, and it's a little bit irregular, so it's, it it would it wouldn't it wouldn't pass the you know quality test of 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 being sold in a shop. And the reason that we did this, we decided that we wanted to make sure that people knew that this isn't an attempt to resolve immediately just with one body of work and going, okay, now we've done it, we've resolved it, and we're fine, we've mended everything, we're cool, like it's all we can now move on. It's actually it's this this kind of conversation will never end. And so the answer is yes, we do want to carry on making work um, and um, either on our own or together, but it's definitely a conversation that we want to keep going. And, um, and I think 
th there's quite an exciting thing that that may happen, which is um, the William Morris Gallery in London um, have shown great interest in showing the the work, and I think it's particularly interesting that they want to show the work because they are apparently in a very diverse area of London, which has their own, you know, it has its own kind of issues around colonialism and um, immigration and, you know, diversity. And at the moment, Kehinde Wiley actually has a solo show there. And Kehinde Wiley works very much with William Morris fabrics in his, in his paintings. And, um, and about, um, you know, uh, blackness and portraiture. And, and I think if we can, if we can, take the work into um, a space like that, that, that I think it will be really important for a lot of people in London who are also descendants of the 1820 settlers, but are also people from where the 1820 settlers came from, engage with the conversation from there. So it's not, so it's not just seen as this history that's kind of like as a satellite history sitting on the, on like the edge, end of the you know, African continent somewhere that it's, it's like our history. It actually goes, right back to you know London and I think it would be it would be very helpful to take the conversation there and and, and open it up there um, and I have had a lot of um, comments and, and you know people saying to me that it's although it is this very specific region and specific stories that are coming out of this to to, to the Eastern Cape it resonates with so much of what is happening in other parts of the world in terms of awareness and um, you know, just kind of, again, just, just really, really taking a really good look at where we come from and who we are and who, why we are who we are today. Okay, um, here's another comment of slash question. Um, in John Phillips's 1820 Settler book, Phillips talks about how the pits were closed to the Clausa except for one day of the year when the Clausa were allowed to collect ochre. Um, yes, I think that's true. But again, I think that's incredibly patronizing. And, um, you know, it was in one day, it was like a gesture. But I think even a, a gesture like that is kind of really exacerbates the the pain of and, and is, is even a, a bigger reminder that it's not accessible. So There is a virtual exhibition. Will there be another installation at the GFI at some point? And will the exhibition travel in South Africa? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> what do you, Anna, if you want to answer the GFI thing and then I'll well, answer the other. Yes, well, I think, uh, you know, we've got a lot of interest in um, a lot of people, you know, to actually see the the physical exhibition. It's, it's not the same as seeing it on a video playing um, and actually seeing the textures um, up close. Um, so that's definitely a possibility. And we, uh, you know, everyone should just um, keep, uh, keep looking at our Facebook. And if something comes up and we're planning something, we'll definitely let everyone know. And then um, just, to, just to respond from my side, that the, 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 may, the, the body of work, the, the 10 garments actually make up one body of work. And um, that is called Cuttings 1820 to 2020. And Spear Arts Trust have acquired that as a, as a, as a body of work. So, um, you know, when things start opening up and, um, and we know we get a clearer idea of where and how things can be seen, I'm really hoping that we'll find a space somewhere, another space that South Africans are, are able to see it physically. Do the people from the community in Hamburg and the area have access to the exhibition? If they have seen it, what is their response? Sorry, Anna, could you, I lost you there for a bit. Can you repeat that? Do the people from the community in Hamburg and the area have access to the exhibition and if they have seen it what is their response um do sorry i didn't hear that i can just looking in the chat to see if i can read it should i i can repeat it yeah sorry <laughs> sorry, sorry um can you hear me papa 
Yeah, I can. Thanks. Okay. Do the people from the community in Hamburg and the area have access to the exhibition? And if they have seen it, what is their response? So they have had access to the, the exhibition, to an ex limited access to the exhibition, because in, in that particular rural area, the connectivity is really bad. So it's a huge challenge to be able to um, show and, and engage people in it, you know, with the work. Um, but the um, manager of the Kaiskama Art Project has uh, deliberately made it and shown, shown the artists, engaged with the artists. And, um, um, you know, on, we've, on WhatsApp, I've been chatting to quite a few of the community members who have responded. And, and I was actually saying to my sister this weekend, um, after an interview on SAFM on Saturday, um, it was really, really encouraging because I got about four different messages through the manager of the art project from different community members who I know personally, who all had a really positive responses to it, which m means more to me than anything. Because if, if, that is, if that is their response, then it's better than any kind of Chelsea gallery in New York City. <laughs> Uh, they are they are the critics and and i and i was really really pleased with with how supportive they've been and how supportive they were on that day as well particularly um, i think this body of work provokes amazing dialogue do you have a plan to perhaps make this exhibition available to a wider audience and particularly for the Kosa descendants in this area so I think we've covered a little bit about the um, available to a wider audience um, by, you know, I think when things open up physically, ho hopefully that will also um, inspire people to go and visit the work, artwork. Um, but in terms of getting it out to the rest of the world, I think right now, I know you and I have done what we can <laughs> to to sort of spread the word. And 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 I guess it's it's really up to, you know, people who, who, who respond to the work and, and the people that feel something about the work, they, they, will, help, they will help bring people to the, the work as well. So, um, you know, it, it would be wonderful strategically to go, yes, it would be so great to get it into the National Arts Festival next year. And it would be amazing to, you know, take it into institutions, et cetera, et cetera. But I feel like that's, that is, hopefully something that will organically happen on its own because because people will come will be drawn to the work, work for personal reasons okay just um a comment this conversation is universal and could go around the world if you consider the indigenous people of north america the aborigines of australia there are many more to consider Another comment. Thank you for hosting this Q and A and this exhibition. Please convey my appreciation to all the artists. A question: Did the Kaiskama artists bring any archival material of their own in the making of the garments? That's a really, really uh, another really great question. So, um, the the history side that was brought to the table from the Kaiskama Art Project artists was from oral, from oral storytelling, was from things that they'd been told. When I went up to Hamburg and we had our third workshop, we actually went, um, I was invited to their homes and we took some of the things that they have in their homes and we made photograms and there's one photogram that we used in one of the dresses at the back of Nozetti's dress. And I, and w when we chose, you know, I asked if they had any historical um, evidence, you know, any old photographs or any old outfits or anything. And, and, and they, they didn't have any, anything archival as in his, you know, sort of antique. So then we, so then we spoke about the things that were important to them. And Nozetti had this, glass bird like one of those glass blown ornament birds 
and she said let's let's take that and we took that to the studio and we made a photogram of the of this bird so and that was quite interesting because it, it it was just it was it was like the the modern day it was like the it was like the modern museum and just the modern the the the, the modern um uh, object that she was she, she was responding to so so i don't know if that answers the question adequately there's a there's a question that came up now <laughs> that you're talking about um someone wants to know what is a photogram oh it's a photogram is is a way of making an, a photographic image without using a camera so you use natural light so you use chemicals in natural light and you take you put chemicals onto onto a surface like fabric or a, or a piece of paper and then and then you expose it to the light for a few a few set, you know a few minutes and then you and then you take it and you and you and it stops developing as soon as you put it in water so it's a, it's a very it's a, it's a very old fashioned way of of making a photograph um it was used typically by um biologists and people look you know looking at specimen and and um recording things like you know plant species or algae or um but it's become a, a it's kind of a romantic nod to photography but it's also you can take it to different edgy um kind of uh, processes at the same time uh, comment i hope this work will be included in the sa art curriculum and get schools to see it um, as a storyteller, I'm curious about what stories the process evoked as you work together. Is there a possibility of curating a storytelling performance or something like that by the artists or the community members? I think that would be absolutely incredible and really, really powerful. And, um, and I hadn't actually thought about doing something like that. And I think it would be really powerful. Um, and I think the story, the storytelling was more about response. It, while we were working and when we were in workshops, the storytelling was very much about the responses to making the work. So, so the, the uh, you know, I, I made notes as, as we were working, what, what women were saying about what it evoked in them to make the work. Um, and, and yes, and some stories came out of that, some stories about remembering when you know when 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 someone was this wonderful story about um Nozetti when she was a little girl um she didn't um she she doesn't know her real birthday and her um her grandmother just chose a, a random birthday for her which was the same birthday as the boy next door and when it came to school going time the way they worked out how, if she was old enough to go was that she had to put her arm over her head and if she could touch if she could touch her ear then she then she was old enough to go to school so she said it was such a she, you know it, it felt like the most logical thing in, at the time but when she thinks back on it now she could have been overdeveloped or underdeveloped and she said and that kind of thing it, it sort of it came out while we were you know like memories thinking about and that came from a story that she was telling about what her mother had been wearing and or her grandmother had been wearing because her grandmother raised her we're talking about her grandmother's clothes and then and then this other story came out so so it's it, um there was a lot of there were a lot of related you know stories that came out from memory and remembering a comment it is not surprising that they did not have any antiques it would have been wonderful to take some of the words of the oral history and to include them in the clothes. Uh, a possibility yeah. would be to show the work in the gallery in Hamburg in December so that local school children and adults can see the body of work and discuss its meaning for them. Um, well, that is if anyone still has a question uh we have five minutes left um um i'm gonna i'm gonna keep the chat i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna keep an eye on the chat um but in the meantime um 
you know, I would like to thank everyone for participating and for all the interesting questions. If anyone might have not had a look at the exhibition by now, you can go to our website where you will also find talks from Pippa and Nozetti, as well as a detailed catalogue, including info and prices of the work. Um, well, we got a comment, well done, a very special, special exhibition, and thank you for this Q&A. Thank you for an enriching discussion. So I think that, you know, brings us to the end of our Q&A. Um, as I said, you can go and have a look at the website again. And if you have any questions, you can contact me via email at manager at gfrartgallery.com or you can give me a call at 041-586-3973. I will be posting the recorded Q&A on our Facebook page for anyone that might have missed out. And please also go and like our Facebook page to keep up to date for any future events and um, you know when we might bring the exhibition back to P when we can actually open and have everyone come and join in a live exhibition. Thank you Pippa um, and thank you Mabali. Thank you so much Anna for organizing this. It was, it was a great thing to do. Um, so there's a few comments, let me just read them. Uh, thank you, Pippa, Nozetti, and all the other artists for highlighting such internationally pertinent topics in such a beautiful and sensitive way. Thank you. We are still learning. And thank you all. Amazing work. And, and I just quickly want to say thank you so much to everybody who's joined. And like I did at the opening, I couldn't help sneaking. I kept on sneaking onto the participants list. And it's just so wonderful to see people from, from as far flung as Seattle <laughs> and um, and it's just yeah so thank you from everywhere from Seattle between Seattle and here <laughs> it's just great to see you all thank you um, yes thank you Pippa and Mabali uh, your discussion was very informative and I'm sure everyone thoroughly enjoyed the evening with you and have a good evening thank you Anna and everyone <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Mbali. We'll chat soon. Thank you, everybody. Yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Very good. Well done. What do you see on the screen? <laughs>